Ah, science. That glorious pursuit of knowledge, so crucial to human civilization and progress. But how far can we be trusted with the knowledge we gain from science? We're very clever when it comes to theories, experiments and innovation. But how good are we at applying ethics, reason and self-control? If history and literature are anything to go by, we're hopeless at it. The deep irony of scientific knowledge is that we can lose our minds over it. It's ironic because we expect it to bring us closer to enlightenment and rationality. But sometimes the opposite happens, and the power of knowledge awakens our lowest, most selfish instincts. That's why The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is one of the most satisfying science fiction horror stories ever written. It falls into this category because the plot or storyline of this novella or short novel is based on imagined scientific discoveries. The protagonist or main character, Dr. Jekyll, uses scientific methods to develop a potion. He uses chemistry to defy a hard law of life that our complex identity is confined to one physical body in our lifetime. He even risks death in the process. Why? Because the temptation of a discovery overcame the suggestions of alarm. In his final confession, Dr. Jekyll admits that his curiosity eclipsed his reason. The allure of a powerful discovery was stronger than his fear of the consequences. Does that make him selfish, heroic, or just reckless? Stevenson uses the familiar metaphor of crossroads to depict Dr. Jekyll's point of no return. Remember, a metaphor is when one thing is described as something else, even though it isn't literally true. Dr. Jekyll describes the night he finally succeeded with the potion as the fatal crossroads and admits that everything would have been different if he'd approached his discovery in a more noble spirit. This suggests that we can't blame science, only the person who uses it. It's all about their intentions. And Dr. Jekyll's intentions were clearly off. His eventual breakthrough allows him to take the physical form of someone else, Mr. Hyde, a being who embodies the evil side of Dr. Jekyll's nature. What a jaw-dropping discovery! Dr. Jekyll is then free to pursue his long-repressed desires without fear for his spotless reputation among London's elite. And since Dr. Jekyll's nameless situation lies apart from ordinary laws, he allows himself to relax the grasp of conscience. It's a constant problem. Laws are always playing catch-up with scientific innovation. As a result, Dr. Jekyll lets loose and becomes desensitised to Mr. Hyde's evil deeds, like stomping on children and murder. The danger is first perceived by Mr. Gabriel Utterson, whose narrative point of view is our focal point throughout the story. It's like we're seeing and hearing things over Utterson's shoulder as he tries to understand what's going on with his dear friend, Dr. Henry Jekyll. So why did Stevenson select Utterson to be our point of view? Well, the beauty of it is we get to enjoy the full impact of the big reveal along with Utterson. Utterson is characterised or depicted as a realistic, pragmatic sort of guy. He's a lover of the sane and customary sides of life. So his imagination only stretches to the theory that Mr Hyde is blackmailing poor Dr Jekyll. Later, he surmises that Dr Jekyll is seized with one of those maladies that both torture and deform the sufferer. Never in his wildest dreams could Utterson have imagined the truth, that the unscientific balderdash Dr Lanyon briefly refers to is the root of Dr Jekyll's problems. Dr. Lanyon is another old friend of Dr. Jekyll's, but their friendship is strained because he believes Dr. Jekyll became too fanciful in his scientific endeavours. 
Dr. Lanyon was disturbed by Dr. Jekyll's loss of reason as he began to go wrong, wrong in mind. And even though Dr. Lanyon doesn't have all the facts yet, he says that Dr. Jekyll's offences would have estranged Damon and Pythias. This is an allusion or reference to a Greek legend about two men who were the very best of friends. Apparently, Dr. Jekyll's studies are so bizarre, so unorthodox, that no self-respecting scientist could remain friends with him. Of course, Utterson, the lawyer, being a man of no scientific passions, doesn't follow this up. But why would he? Stevenson depicts Utterson and Lanyon as foils for Dr. Jekyll. They're characters who contrast with our protagonist to highlight his obsession with transcendental medicine. Utterson and Lanyon both have their feet planted in reason and reality, whereas Dr. Jekyll has gone off on a mystical tangent, mixing science and the occult to unlock dangerous secrets. As far as Dr. Jekyll is concerned, the feeling is mutual. He calls Dr. Lanyon a hidebound pedant, an ignorant, blatant pedant. The repetition of pedant, where it's mentioned more than once, highlights Dr. Jekyll's resentment. Is Lanyon just a goody two shoes? Or is Dr. Jekyll annoyed that Lanyon called him out for misusing science? Here, Stevenson foreshadows, or hints at, Dr. Jekyll's hubris or excessive pride, which stems from his obvious talent as a scientist. He's defensive about his achievements and sulks that Lanyon doesn't share his interests or admire him for his efforts. However, Dr. Jekyll eventually confides in Utterson that he's in distress, although he withholds the details. In dialogue, or a conversation between Jekyll and Utterson, the doctor exclaims, I have had a lesson. Oh God, Utterson, what a lesson I have had. This comes after Mr Hyde murders Sir Danvers Carew, a respected politician, and becomes one of London's most wanted. But does Dr Jekyll's lesson lie in the fact that his scientific breakthrough has caused a public injury? or that he's now at risk of being exposed. Utterson simply believes that Dr Jekyll has had a lucky escape from the murderous Mr Hyde, but he couldn't be more wrong. A nasty side effect of Dr Jekyll's imperfect potion is that his body chemistry is altered. This is the problem with being your own guinea pig. An unforeseen reversal takes place. Mr Hyde begins to take over and Dr. Jekyll must take the potion to transform back into his original self. This realisation strikes terror into Dr. Jekyll's heart, as sudden and startling as the crash of symbols. The simile here, which describes his realisation as being like the sudden crash of sound, vividly portrays the jolt he must have felt. Can you imagine? Boom! Life as he knew it is over. In a climactic scene of horror, Mr Hyde prepares the potion in Dr Lanyon's presence. Stevenson uses sensory imagery to describe how the mixture began to brighten in colour, to effervesce audibly and to throw off small fumes of vapour. Stevenson offers us these details to help us imagine the sight, sound and smell of this chemical reaction. Can you hear the bubbling? and smell the toxic fumes? This is Dr Jekyll's moment of triumph over his pedantic colleague. Hyde declares he's opening a new province of knowledge and new avenues to fame and power. This deluded declaration characterises Dr Jekyll as an archetype or typical example of the mad scientist an anarchist genius whose obsession warps his sense of reason and degrades his humanity. Imagine if Dr Jekyll shared a lab with Victor Frankenstein. Wowza! Before Mr Hyde skulls the potion, he exults in the moment of revelation. Stevenson uses anaphora in Hyde's declaration to Dr Lanyon. 
You who have so long been bound to the most narrow and material views, you who have denied the virtue of transcendental medicine, you who have derided your superiors, behold! He repeatedly begins each phrase with the same accusatory words because Dr. Jekyll has a professional score to settle. Then comes the hideous visual imagery of Mr. Hyde's transformation into Dr. Jekyll. He reeled, staggered, gasping with open mouth. His face became suddenly black and the features seemed to melt and alter. Visual imagery is when words help us see a mental picture and Stevenson is doing his best to freak us out. Is it working? Poor Dr. Lanyon doesn't cope. His mind is submerged in terror as he watches on. This emotive language, or words that describe emotion, depicts how frightening science can be in the wrong hands. So frightening, in fact, that Dr. Lanyon doesn't survive the shock. This is astonishing because, as a medical doctor, he would have seen some confronting things in his time. Obviously, this was next level. Artisan learns the truth of all this through letters from Dr. Lanyon and Dr. Jekyll, which partly makes this an epistolary narrative. Using things like letters, written confessions, wills and other documents to tell a story has been a popular technique for novelists, especially in the horror genre. It helps make a fantastical story, especially a shilling shocker like this one, more believable and chilling. We all love a thrill. In the end, we learn that Dr. Jekyll's discoveries were incomplete. In the novel's denouement, or resolution, Dr. Jekyll admits that he got lucky with the potion thanks to an unknown impurity. This is one of the reasons why Dr. Jekyll refuses to enter deeply into this scientific branch of his confession. The other reason expresses the novella's moral message that our inner complexity is bound forever on man's shoulders and when the attempt is made to cast it off, it but returns upon us with more unfamiliar and more awful pressure. In other words, Dr Jekyll believes that we all need to deal with our own complexity. It's a burden we can't escape without causing serious harm. And trying to dissociate from our troublesome parts can inadvertently make them more troublesome. Thus, Dr. Jekyll takes the details of his methodology to his grave, which is probably for the best. So, to all the scientists and anarchist geniuses out there, here's a question. Will you use your talents for good? We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons, check out our other videos.